So, uh, without uh, further ado, uh, I would like to uh, welcome you all uh, to another interesting uh, case presentation and uh, discussion uh, on behalf of uh, Spice Food Kerala. Today's topic is uh, related to gastrointestinal disease. And uh, to moderate the session, we have a very young, dynamic, and handsome uh, gastroenterologist with us, Dr. Joe Francis Matthew. Uh, who is currently a consultant department of gastroenterology at Medical Trust Hospital. Uh, Dr. Matthew uh, has done his uh, MBBS from uh, Trishul Medical College and uh, MD from uh, Coimbatore Medical College and uh, DMB from uh, Aster Med City. Uh, he's uh, very uh, well known among his patients for his uh, clinical acumen uh, and his uh, colleagues as well. And uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, Dr. M uh, Matthew will be able to uh, guide us uh, regarding this session and uh, share his expertise with us. And to present this topic, we have Dr. Suchita, Suchitra, who is a second year uh, DNB resident at uh, Medical Trust Hospital. Uh, since we have uh, started a bit late, uh, so I guess we'll uh, directly dive into the topic. Over to you, Dr. Suchitra. Okay, so uh, basically, uh, we'll just take up the history completely because this patient has a long history that uh, spans over two decades. So uh, first, after the history, so we'll just, after history, we'll just start the discussion. So Sujitra, we can start off. Sujitra? Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you're audible, Suhitra. Okay. Shall I start, sir? Yeah, start, start, start. So I was just okay. telling, you just go ahead uh, with the history and uh, okay, then sir. we'll take up the discussion. Okay, sir. So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me express my gratitude to the Spice Road Kerala chapter for giving this wonderful opportunity for me. So uh, today we are discussing uh, a very interesting case related to the Pandora's box of human body, the gastrointestinal system. So let me start. So we had a 57 year old male who was a businessman and he was residing at Nagulam itself. And his chief complaints were an abscess in the right forearm for the past eight days, shortness of breath for past five days, fever for last two days, abdominal distension for last two days, and melina, two episodes. And the history of his present complaints are, uh, he now presented with a small boil in the middle aspect of his right forearm, which eight days back, gradually increased in size with surrounding erythema, edema, and pain, and no history of any trauma, insect bite, or similar lesions elsewhere. Later, he developed shortness of breath, which was insidious in onset, worsened while he was climbing stairs and relieved after taking rest for some time. No history of paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or orthopnea, fetal edema, and no history of chest pain, palpitation, cough, or fever, and patient also noticed a progressive abdominal distension over the past few days and no history of abdomen pain, vomiting, or constipation. Because of these complaints, he went to nearby hospital. Investigations showed severe anemia with a hemoglobin level of 4.8. And he got admitted there and transfused two units of pack red cells from there. And during that hospital stay, he developed fever with chills and rigor, and his abscess in the right arm got ruptured too. He also had two episodes of malina, and no history of hematemesis or any other bleeding manifestations or jaundice, high colored urine, weight loss, loss of appetite, or altered sensorium. From there, patient was referred to our hospital for further evaluation and management. So this is the present history of the patient. And so, coming Chitra, to the past history, as well. Yeah. yeah, so basically, as uh, this is just uh, the presenting complaint. So this is uh, over a span of maybe eight days. 
so why i told we will just discuss everything after the history is because the main major part of the history comes after this so so if we can continue with the past history and the relevant uh, history that you asked during the past history and then we'll take up discussion we we'll carry on carry on okay thank you so coming to the past history patient had a history of jaundice in 1990 he underwent local or some traditional treatment options and he had history of shortness of breath on exertion in 2003 for which he was evaluated at mch trivandrum found to have severe anemia with a hemoglobin level of 4.6 us abdomen was at that time that is in 2003 which showed a dilated portal vein with splenomegaly and normal liver and two units of packard cells was transfused and on further evaluation he also found to have an enlarged spleen that is in 2003 In view of pancytopenia, extensive workup was done, including upper gastrointestinal endoscopy and bone marrow study, which was reported to be normal. And the official report is not available and only verbally provided history from the patient itself. He was discharged with oral iron supplements then, and patient also claimed that his liver functions were told to be normal. Patient so, remained to be. Uh, basically, so like uh, since the patient in two thousand three, that means almost twenty years back. he presented with severe anemia and definitely when the doctors there worked up they he found, it was found to have pancreatopenia so okay. this extensive work up could you just elaborate some of the major work up that is been done to rule out the causes for pancreatopenia especially in a setting of splenomegaly uh, obviously uh, they would have done a uh, blood complete blood work up peripheral smear should be uh, noted and okay. uh, uh, and also radiological investigations including um, ultrasound and uh, obviously they should look for any bone marrow infiltrative lesions or uh, bone marrow uh, what are uh, destructive lesions also uh, so mm-hmm. they had done a bone marrow study also okay so uh, uh, basically when you look at the causes of pancreatopenia and with splenomegaly so you can uh, classify the causes as like uh, something that is transient so some viral infections Like a cytomegalo or a parvo B19 viruses can cause pancreatopenia. You should always ask about the drug history. Some drugs can cause pancreatopenia, and definitely nutritionally, vitamin B12 deficiency is known to cause oh, like uh, pancreatopenia. And uh, so, and also very rarely these syndromes like parasitic nocturnal hematuria, hemoglobinuria, and uh, also definitely the patient has pneumogaly. So a serious pneumogaly yes. with pancreatopenia. we should always think about any hematological causes like any uh, mds or this myeloproliferative disorders disorders and uh, definitely so the work up goes like that so a patient who has been having okay uh, so now we we'll get to the rest of the history you can carry on you can carry on ah uh, okay sir um, so um, after this period that is in the 2003 and he claimed that he remained to be asymptomatic for the next 15 years Uh, so uh, 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 basically this point is important just keep in mind a patient who has been uh, who had pancreatopenia with an enlarged spleen over 20 years back has been asymptomatic for 15 years so i'll just come to the point by the end of the history but just keep in mind this history okay continue fine okay. so he remained to be uh, asymptomatic till he presented with a new symptom in 2018 that is the patient had two episodes of hematemesis He had evaluated another hospital. Again, his hemoglobin was found to be four point eight, along with severe leukopenia and thrombocytopenia. Multiple blood transfusions, uh, that is, blood components, were given at that time. And again, they had done an upper gastrointestinal endoscopy, and at that time, found to have esophageal varices for which uh, endoscopic uh, ligation was done. The bone marrow study was again repeated, and which was again reported to be normal. He also had transient ascites at that time, which resolved spontaneously after a couple of months. And again, in 2021, he developed abdominal distension, and he found to have ascites. And ascitic tapping was done thrice over a period of six months. During this period, found to be diabetic and deranged renal parameters, and for which he was started medications, but patient himself stopped the, all the, all those medications. And uh, I also to, uh, asked about his neonatal and childhood history. Which was uh, said to be normal by the patient. So this is the past history of the patient, 
and coming to the personal history. And he had history of alcohol consumption in the late 1990s. And he used to take around two packs, around 60 ml of brandy per week. And he was a non-smoker and he consumes predominantly vegetarian diet. His appetite was good. Bowel and bladder habits were normal and sleep was also normal. And he was not on any regular medications when he presented to us. And family history, um, he was uh, born out of a non-consanguineous marriage and no history of similar complaints about his family members, no history of any um, NCDs, malignancies, or, or even genetic disorders in the family. And he's married and he's having two children also. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so as you can say, what all uh, comes to your mind? So what could be the patient, what could be happening to the patient now? Uh, uh, at present, uh, of course, he may be in sepsis, uh, secondary to that abscess in his uh, forearm. And okay. uh, he's also having a recurrent gastrointestinal bleeding because he had a history of two episodes of hematemesis. Now he is yeah. presented with malina. So, of course, mm -hmm. there is a uh, gastrointestinal bleeding, which can be secondary to portal hypertension. But okay. uh, the cause of portal hypertension, I think we have to, uh, and that part has to be discussed in the um, examination part itself. Uh, so uh, basically, if you look at the history, uh, we all definitely would have uh, know, like come across a lot of variceal bleeds in our practice. So as we all know, the most common cause for variceal bleed is cirrhosis that leads to portal hypertension that causes variceal formation in the esophagus and or maybe in the stomach that present as variceal bleed. But like if you look at the scenario, that's why I told to keep a watch or uh, just keep in mind about the uh, clinical uh, the history that he had. He was diagnosed to have some form of portal hypertension 20 years back. So that is 2003, he had pancytopenia with splenomegaly. So if he would have had a normal garden variant of cirrhosis 20 years back, literature says that a patient who has significant portal hypertension in the form of pancytopenia and hypersplenism they would definitely go into other complications like the aspect literature, uh, decompositing events. Uh, like the decompositing events in cirrhosis, as we all know, are like present of formation of jaundice, patient can develop ascites, patient can develop encephalopathy, and variceal bleed. So once there is in a setting of cirrhosis when he has significant portal hypertension, over the span of, span of next five years, the incidence or the development of these complications are almost 40 to 50 percentage. And as the years go by, definitely other signs of liver failure would be evident in, this patient, in, in the patient if he had a garden variety of cirrhosis. But this patient has been asymptomatic with a normal liver function over 15 years. So that is something uh, that is unusual in a non natural history of patient who has cirrhosis. So that's when we should think about other causes for portal hypertension. And as we, as we saw in the history, and then at some points in this history that uh, says that patient has significant portal hypertension is because he has a direct portal vein in the imaging and the splenomegaly. And as uh, years went by, he developed varices. But uh, as we can see, even after a variceal bleed that happened in 2018, he uh, has been pretty normal. Like he had transcendentitis, but he didn't, have to take regular treatment or medication as a cirrhotic patient would need. So something odd in this history that would suggest you think about other causes of portal hypertension is what I would come as, as, as what I would like to say about. So other causes like there's an entity called non cirrhotic portal hypertension. So that's what most probably this patient is having. So but to diagnose this entity we need to rule out all the other causes. And let's see if the examination part of this history and case presentation puts light to the diagnosis or not. Okay, so we can continue with the examination. Okay, sir. So general examination of the patient, he was very conscious, cooperative, oriented to time, place, and person, and he was ephebrate. He was pallor, no ictus, clubbing, lymphonopathy, or pedal edema and vitals, pulse rate 104 per minute, normal rhythm, high volume, normal character, no vessel wall thickening, no radio radial delay or radio femoral delay, peripheral pulse is palpable. BP 110 by 60 in right upper arm supine posture, the CO2 99, 98 percentage in Romeo, 
respiratory rate 28 per minute abdominal thoracic type no usage of accessory muscles and his jvp was not elevated Connected to examination, no features of cachexia, so, no uh, alopecia. So, one second, one second. So, uh, among the examination, definitely, now the main aim of the examiner's patient is to see if the patient has got anything, any signs, anything from the examination that clings or points towards whether he has an underlying liver dysfunction or cirrhosis. So, could you just go to the head-to-toe head -to -toe examination? So the head to toe, head to, head head to toe examination. Uh, from head to toe, as we, we've been uh, taught from the MVPS days that all those features of liver failure, like as uh, Swetra is mentioning that there is no alopecia. Okay, you can say Swetra, you can say yes. No alopecia, fetal hepaticus or jaundice, no parotid swelling, gynecomastia or testicular atrophy, no loss of secondary sexual characters or spider navy, no palmar erythema, sandalisma, scratch marks, but he had deputant contracture. Okay, so depression contracture, even though we as we see in the literature, is in association with cirrhosis. But uh, but the the other uh, main features that we see, basically uh, something like uh, peritoneal enlargement or uh, palmar erythema, and that typical like a jaundice history or uh, loss of uh, sexual characters or the facial and uh, chest hair and presence of spider navi. See, so things are not there in this patient. So uh, still, see, if you see the patient, uh, if he had cirrhosis, he would have had any of these uh, sigmata of chronic liver disease by this time because uh, his disease started almost 20 years back. And so it's high time that he would have developed uh, an end stage liver disease by this time. So that's why we always should think whether this could be something else other than cirrhosis that is causing all this. Okay, carry on, carry on. So coming to the systemic examination, so small, the gastrointestinal system. Uh, inspection, his abdomen was distended and flanks were full. You know where the abdomen was shiny, umbilicus was everted with central slit. All quadrants of the abdomen moves with respiration and dilated veins were seen over the right hypochondria. No visible mass or pulsations, peristalsis, SARS or sinuses, and his hernial orifices was normal. And coming to palpation, superficial palpation, his temperature was no surface temperature was normal, no tenderness, guarding or rigidity, no fluid thrill, and his abdominal girth at the level of umbilicus was 104 centimeters. And on deep palpation, uh, his liver was not at all palpable, and there was no right hypochondrial tenderness or no pulsations. And spleen, there was a palpable, uh, as a firm, a firm mass extending from the left hypochondrium towards umbilicus, which moves downwards and medially with respiration. It was firm in consistency, non-tender, surface was smooth, well-defined edges, no table to insinuate the fingers between left coastal margin and the mass, and no was felt in the medial border. And the degree of enlargement was more than five fingers and around 7.5 centimeters. And there was no other masses palpable, terminal orifices was normal. Direction of flow in the dilated vein over the right hypochondrium was away from the umbilicus, and abdominal girth was 104 centimeters. And on percussion, liver, upper border was at the fifth right intercostal space in mid clavicular line. Liver span was around 10 centimeters. Prop space was dull. Lower left intercostal space dull even on full inspiration. Shifting dullness was present. And on auscultation, bowel sounds were audible. There was no hepatic or splenic run, no hepatic or renal brewing. No succussion splash. The rectal examination, not done. And coming to other systems, cardiovascular system, apex beat at left, fifth intercostal space, one centimeter medial to the midclavicular line. S1, S2 was present and pan-systolic murmur was there. Respiratory system, inspection, it was symmetrical. Uh, so uh, definitely yeah. respiratory system is important in this case since he's been having uh, progressive breathlessness. So definitely we should uh, take respiratory system. Uh, I would suggest if you would say the respiratory system before cardiovascular because history wise, there is nothing conclusive to say that cardiovascular disease, uh, some uh, underlying cardiovascular disease is there because he didn't have any orthopnea or PND. So respiratory system, you can say continue with the respiratory system. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the respiratory movements were decreased on the right side and he was mm -hmm. tachypneic. Okay. And on palpation, 
And in palpation, his surface temperature was normal, no tenderness over chest wall. Trachea was shifted to the left side. Respiratory movements reduced in the right mammary, interscapular, infrascapular, and infraaxillary areas. And vocal parameters, it was again reduced in the right mammary, interscapular, infrascapular, and infraaxillary areas. And the dimensions of the chest wall, transverse diameter was 28 centimeters, and anteroposterior diameter around 15 centimeters, and chest expansion was 2 centimeters. And on percussion, there is a stony, dull note over right mammary, endoscapular, infrascapular, and the infraaxillary areas. And on auscultation, crepitation was present over right mammary, endoscapular, infrascapular, and infraaxillary areas. And vocal resonance decreased in the right mammary, endoscapular, infrascapular, and infraaxillary areas. And the spring pectoral was absent. And central nervous system, no focal neurological deficit, higher mental functions were normal. Okay, so after examination, uh, basically, Sujitra, what all more uh, information did we get? Uh, so in the examination part, we basically uh, checked whether there is any signs of cirrhosis for this patient. Um, mm -hmm. Except for the dipoidrans contraction, which can be occur in other conditions also, there was no other signs of cirrhosis in this patient. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got uh, findings in the right side of the lungs. Obviously, there can be a uh, moderate or massive pleural effusion can be there from the okay. examination part itself. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, you that, and you said there was minimal shifting dullness and stimulus of the patient. Yes, sir. Obviously, okay. there is an ascites okay. also. Okay, fine. And uh, with a right pleural effusion, right? Yes, sir. Uh, did you get any uh, like uh, any schematic patches over the over the skin or any other bleeding manifestations like bleeding gums or anything like that? Nothing, sir. The examination part is different, and also in the history part, uh, no such history was obtained. Okay, fine. And there was Melina, okay. Meli, two episodes, but, but that before uh, he was presenting to our institution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can just summarize the history part and the examination positive findings, and then we'll go ahead. Go on, go on. So a 57 year old male patient, uh, non case of type two diabetes mellitus and renal dysfunction, uh, who's not on any medication, with past history of jaundice, severe anemia, and multiple blood transfusions, ascites, upper GA bleed for which AVL was done, now presented with complaints of an abscess in the right forearm. Shortness of breath on excursion, abdominal distension, fever with chills and rigor, and two episodes of melina. He was evaluated from outside hospital, found to have severe anemia, transfused two units of pacrisis and rougher. On examination, he had tachycardia, high volume pulse, was pale, had dipotence contracture, distended abdomen with shifting dullness, dilated vein over right hypochondrium with its direction of flow away from the umbilicus, and a palpable mass in the left hypochondrium extending towards umbilicus probably a massive splenomegaly with no features of hepatomegaly and the trachea shifted to the left side with reduced focal parameters with uh, reduced focal parameters, focal resonance and reduced respiratory movements and a stony dull note over right mammary, interscapular, infrascapular and infraaxillary areas, likely possibility of a moderate, moderate to severe right-sided pleural effusion. Okay. Um, so, uh, so it, uh, like uh, since we were telling about the the history part, and so discussing the history part, and after examination, since there is no features of underlying liver cell failure per se, so that's when we should think about these uh, other causes for variceal bleed, that is portal hypertension, where this entity of non serotic portal hypertension comes into. Right. So basically, if you look at this history, if you are, like it's a very interesting history where you can see a, a person who's been uh, like having a like if you uh, look at the history charted with the jaundice in 1990. So if you if you want to take the jaundice as seriously as something that could have caused the cirrhosis, it's highly unlikely, I would say, because uh, this jaundice happened in 1990 and that was almost 30 years back. Uh, so, a patient who's been uh, had jaundice, if it had been something like a hepatitis B infection that is chronically going into a uh, uh, like that causes cirrhosis in the patient, 
he would definitely have developed the complications unless it was we know definitely is not taking treatment for in the form of any antivirals from the history so uh, definitely that jaundice is not relevant in this in our history since uh, there are no other complications of hepatitis b or like sort of like going to cirrhosis in this patient because if you look at the natural history of patients who have chronic hep b infection they uh, only 5% uh, i would like to tell you only 5% of patients who develop hepatitis b infection go on to chronicity and among these 5% patients unless you start treatment at the right time patients who definitely because uh, the leading cause for hepatocellular carcinoma till the development of uh, newer treatment for hepatitis b was hepatitis b infection the cause for hepatocellular carcinoma and so if you took the time frame of patients who have cirrhosis due to hepatitis b infection uh, definitely within 10 15 years almost more than 60% of patients would develop hepatocellular carcinoma so in this patient you can't attribute that si that uh, jaundice to be a cause for cirrhosis so definitely cirrhosis is uh, not in, not in the picture so i would like to uh, emphasis on the fact that that jaundice is you can just neglect that jaundice history and then coming to the next event that happened was in 3 so that's when the patient had uh, lethargy tiredness and on evaluation as we discussed he was found to have pancreatic which is large spleen so at this setting definitely the treating doctors would have definitely worked up extensively for cause of pancreatic a bone marrow dial was done twice so a bone marrow done twice one in 2003 and 2018 definitely rules out all the bone marrow uh, pathologies since uh, he didn't have any treatment over the past 20 years and he's been relatively uh, from that blood uh pancreatic side other than taking transfusions it has uh, there were no other life threatening situations in his life during the past 20 years so a bone marrow cause for this pancreatic megaly is almost ruled out and as i was discussing earlier a cirrhosis if it would have been cirrhosis back in 2003 definitely by 20 years he would have definitely developed other complications of cirrhosis and uh, unless intervened by a transplant or the specific management like ovarian bleed in the form of like tips procedures and all definitely he is uh, he would have either succumbed to his illness or his life, his uh, clinical condition would have deteriorated drastically so since these two are not there definitely you should think about all uh, this uh, entity called non cirrhotic port hypertension so uh, after ex- after uh, since we have come to the end of history and examination Uh, there are some blood investigations and we'll just discuss the investigations and we'll see if we can get more idea about what this patient is having we'll go to the investigations sir putra okay sir so these are the following investigations we had done for this patient and okay, complete so, blood count uh, we can see that the patient is having a low hemoglobin and total count is very low and with a very low platelet count so he's having pancreatopenia And the real functions, so uh, you can carry on. You can carry on. And uh, the RFT was found to be altered uh, with an urea of ninety five and a creatinine level of two point six. And uh, LFT, the total bilirubin was just zero point seven one. Direct bilirubin was zero point four one. And uh, SGOT was sixteen and SGPT was seventeen. And his serum albumin was three. And with a procalcitonin level of three point seven three. And uh, INR, PTI INR value of thirty three point two by two point five six, and serum electrolytes was sodium level of one thirty six and potassium value of six point one. Okay, uh, so and we had done in, uh, in these uh, liver function tests, you can see that the, these are the points that I would, I would like to emphasize. Uh, so, with a normal, like if a patient who is having cirrhosis, he would have definitely had a mild elevation, would have been doing by this time because. With severe sepsis, with a bloodstream infection, he has been having an MRSA infection, and uh, due to that uh, boil on his right forearm, and uh, with the procal of three point seven, definitely, if he had had underlying liver disease, his bilirubin would have gone up at least by above five, and he would have had hypoalbuminemia. Enzymes definitely, in an end stage liver disease, enzymes won't be elevated. I won't be surprised if the enzymes are normal in this stage also. But uh, INR, okay, INR here is two point five six. So uh, that indicates mild uh, liver cell uh, dysfunction. But in a setting of sepsis, 
uh, this uh, coagulation uh, parameters may be varied. And uh, there is a prokill of 3.7, and uh, definitely there is an evidence of sepsis. But the liver functions, if you say the bilirubin, is uh, something uh, very uh, like you should always keep an eye on bilirubin in patients with cirrhosis. So since the bilirubin is normal, these are more points to say that his underlying liver would be like not so bad. Okay, carry on, carry on, sir. Carry on. Uh, and the peripheral smear report, uh, it shows a dimorphic anemia with an iron cyclocytosis. Then elliptocytes, acanthocytes, there was one to two schistocytes per hypophy, few spherocytes, marked leukopenia, and also thrombocytopenia. And pus mm -hmm. culture and sensitivity. In this uh, uh, peripheral smear, uh, definitely there are features of hemolysis. Uh, like typically in place patients who have panserapenia due to uh, like dyspinomegaly, uh, typically they do not have a signs of hemolysis and peripheral blood, uh, blood film. But since this patient is having sepsis, that may be the cause for this uh, few exercises. But the literature say patients may have pieces of CMRS, but typically not seen. That's it. Okay, carry on. Okay, sir. And from uh, post -op culture as well as blood culture of this patient, we got MRSA at the cylinder resistance staph aureus. And the stoop occult blood was positive for this patient. And yeah, uh, we, we're, not, we're not alarmed by that because definitely a patient has some form of melina. So definitely stoop occult blood will be positive. Okay, carry on. This was the initial investigations that they carried out in that patient. And following which we had done uh, blood transfusions in view of uh, history of this upper GA bleed and uh, anemia. And following blood transfusion, these are the findings that we got. We repeated the investigations again. And the CBC, the hemoglobin was again 5.7. Total count was again 1,980. And with the PCV again fallen to 19.3 and a platelet count of again 22,000. We had done both packed cell transfusion as well as platelet transfusion for this patient. But even after transfusion, the repeat values came as this. And RFT, uh, the urea was 129 and creatinine again was sent to 3.4 with a serum electrolyte level of 130 bar 4.6. And yeah. INR again was sent to 3.27. Uh, okay, and so we did you have any repeated liver function test reports? Uh, sir, uh, the re repeated values again found to be normal, sir. Okay, fine, fine. Okay. Except for a lower albumin level of again uh, mm -hmm. two point nine uh, and three, okay. all other parameters were within normal limits, except for and this oh. INR also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so acidic fluid. Okay, carry on, carry on, carry on. Acidic fluid study was also done, and this uh, AD was found to be six point three, so it's within the normal limits. Albumin was found to be zero point eight, and the protein level was two point two. Sugar was okay. 200 with a total count of 230 and differential okay. count, granulocyte count was 80 and lymphocyte count was 20. Okay. So uh, this definitely this uh, aseptic uh, showed evaluation in our patient is uh, very important because uh, by analyzing the aseptic fluid, we can uh, find out what the pathology could be. So, uh, so definitely, as Suvitra mentions here, the patient has got a high SAG and low protein ascites. So this is a normal scenario where uh, the portal hypertension and ascites in a setting of portal hypertension, we normally see a high SAG, low protein ascites. And uh, the, okay, carry on, carry on, carry on. Okay, sir. And, and uh, there is no sign of infection because uh, like definitely when sepsis, you should always rule out other causes of infection. But the so definitely there is the ascitic fluid is not the cause for his infection. Okay, carry on, carry on. Okay. Uh, ascitic fluid, we sent culture for the sample also, which also came to be a sterile. Uh, there was no uh, evidence okay. of SPP. Okay, the fine. Chest X-ray. Uh, actually, this is the chest X-ray finding of the patient. Oh, when we take yes. the X-ray, there was a massive okay. right-sided effusion. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, the repeat uh, X-ray was like this. And the final did, did, uh, did we uh, like uh, so the was the did the patient undergo thoracocentesis? Uh, actually, uh, patient was not willing for that, uh, okay, so uh, we are not able to do any thoracocentesis. Okay, fine. Okay. And uh, uh, 
it was to rule out any features of uh, cirrhosis also we had done a fibro scan of the liver and it was reported mm-hmm. having mild to moderate fibrosis okay and, uh, to rule out any other causes even multiple myeloma also we had done an electrophoresis also which showed mm-hmm. again a decreased albumin with a gamma globulin level uh, which is markedly elevated and there was no evidence of monoclonal uh, band Okay. So again, uh, this was the. Your presentation is. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. And then, ah, uh, this was the X-ray uh, picture that we had got. Yeah. Okay. This was uh, X-ray that went in was discharged. Ah, uh, this was X-ray. Okay. Fine, fine. Okay. So before going to the discussion, so even after the blood investigations, ah, uh, like ah, uh, they were we were emphasizing more on the fact that the liver functions, the bilirubin always remained normal, but he had an elevation INR, he had ascites, he had pleural effusion. So, ah, uh, so now. we have a, a complete picture of what is happening to this patient so with this in mind uh, we we shall we shall go in detail about what this non serotic and uh, because uh, some people might have an uh, doubt because the fibro scan showed mild to moderate fibrosis i'll come in, uh, i'll just come in on that while i discuss the disease in detail so uh, swetra so could you just tell us what this non serotic portal hypertension is and just some few points about it could you just tell us what it is uh okay sure sir uh, so before that just a few points sure. about hyperspinism okay okay so uh, in this case the patient is having a massive splenomegaly that is more than uh, five fingers and more than 7.5 cm in its overall length so, and associated with a complete destruction of all the uh, blood parameters thrombocytopenia leukopenia as well as any so hence we have to discuss a parameter called as hyperspinism This is splenic hyperactivity with increased blood cell destruction, and the diagnostic criteria include there should be splenomegaly, pancytopenia, that is anemia, leukopenia, with or without even thrombocytopenia, with a normal or hypercellular bone marrow, and reversible of this particular condition by splenectin. So in this picture, I think in this patient, uh, there is hypersplenism. I think because he is having splenomegaly, he is having pancytopenia. and uh, in the past uh, two bone marrow examination uh, was done for this patient which came to be normal the fourth mm-hmm. parameter has to be uh, hence to be proved and so um, portal hypertension obviously for this patient there is portal hypertension because he is having uh, g endoscopy for the history of various um, various different days of agus for which evl was done and later patient also presented with features of upper ga blade also and also we can see dilated veins and other features of portal hypertension in this patient so mm. portal hypertension uh, we actually what we know is cirrhotic portal hypertension that is uh, actually what we seen in the usual settings so portal hypertension it is a clinical syndrome which is defined by a portal venous pressure gradient between the portal vein and inferior vena cava exceeding 5 mm of mercury cirrhotic portal hypertension is associated with an elevated hepatic venous pressure gradient that is hvpg predominantly due to raised sinusoidal resistance while in the non cirrhotic portal hypertension that is ncph which is usually a, a newer entity or uh, not so discussed entity here the hepatic venous pressure gradient is normal or only mildly elevated and significantly lower than portal vein pressure so under this ncph uh, or so non cirrhotic portal hypertension uh, so basically uh, as sutra was saying Uh, in the patient who is having the like as i mentioned beginning itself in a patient who is having cirrhosis cirrhosis as we all know is an irreversible uh, change in the liver parenchyma due to uh, either an insult by a viral infection or alcohol as we all know or in the upcoming nafld due to the morbid obesity or the lifestyle uh, disease that we have those thing uh, those uh, entities cause inflammation and irreversible damage to the liver parenchyma and that causes increased pressure within the portal vein and that causes all these complications 
So in the normal setting, this HPPG or hepatic venous pressure gradient is actually the difference in the pressure between. So this is actually uh, found out by like, uh, you have to uh, insert a catheter via the jugular vein. And I'm not going into detail of the, how, you, uh, the, how you take the readings. Basically, we just need to see the hepatic venous pressure gradient should be more than five. So as the pressure increases, this HPV increases, uh, each uh, value has got a clinical significance and a value of more than 20 and all that indicates there is significant, uh, more than 10 is considered to be a condition called as clinically significant portal hypertension. And that is when the patient starts to develop varices. And by the time the pressure goes up to 15, then there's increased risk of bleed. And if it's more than 20, they say, literature says that even in spite of doing this variceal banding and all, the risk of mortality with rebleed is high. So measurement of HPPG is crucial in a setting of cirrhosis. But in a patient who's having non-serotic, uh, non-serotic portal hypertension, especially this non-serotic portal fibrosis, here actually, uh, are you talking about that, Sweetra, in the next slide? You're talking about it, right? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, slides yeah, for about after that. The, I'll just add on after that. You can continue with the slides. You can make slides. Uh, okay, sir. So basically, under this NCPH, or non serotic portal hypertension, we are having two entities. We have non serotic yeah. portal fibrosis and EHP, mm -hmm. extra hepatic portal vein obstruction. So, mm -hmm. such uh, about uh, this NCPF, that is non serotic portal fibrosis. And we have a criteria for that, that is APASL criteria. And in NCPF, that is non serotic portal fibrosis, there is presence of moderate to severe splenomegaly. Second one is evidence of portal hypertension, varices with or without collateral, and a patent splenopotal axis and hepatic veins in EVSG Doppler, and test results indicating normal or near normal LFP. And liver histology, there is no evidence of cirrhosis or parenchyma injury. So these are the criteria for so, uh, uh, that the is, So NCPF, as we said now, is an entity. Uh, like we were talking about portal hypertension all this time. So NCPF or non serotic portal fibrosis is an entity where we find evidence of portal hypertension, varices and collaterals. But imaging, a Doppler, uh, shows a normal spinoportal axis. That means the portal vein, there is no obstruction or the portal vein is patent up till the hilum of the liver and the hepatic or the outflow is also normal. So the pathophysiology lies within the intrahepatic part of portal vein. So there is uh, actually, if you look into the uh, biopsy or if you look at the histopathology of these patients, we can see there is portal sclerosis and uh, there is thinning of this portal vein uh, in uh, like in, in if you do a Doppler, there is a classical sign called a withered tree appearance on a Doppler that indicates a sudden sudden cut off of this portal flows after the hilum. So that indicates there is an obstruction beyond into the intrahepatic part of the portal vein, and uh, that causes uh, an increased uh, portal pressures and all these entities. But keep in mind the liver the liver function would be normal in most of these patients. And uh, now to the next uh, type of uh, NCPH, that is EHPVO. Okay, carry on to uh, So EHPVO, it is a vascular disorder of liver, which is characterized by obstruction of the extrahepatic portal vein with or without involvement of intrahepatic portal vein radicals or splenic or superior mesenteric veins. Now included portal cavernoma and recent thrombus into the definition of EHPVO. Okay, so EHPVO is like uh, these two entities are coming under the common branch of non serotic portal hypertension. As I mentioned earlier, this fibrosis, uh, non serotic portal fibrosis, the portal vein would be patent on a, a Doppler study, but the intrahepatic signals would be absent. So the pathology lies intrahepatically. But in the case of EHPVO, that is extrahepatic. As the name suggests, it is extrahepatic portal obstruction. So patient would definitely have uh, on, ongoing thrombosis in the portal vein or splenic vein, or he may even have thrombus extending into the superior vein. 
So uh, such patients due to this chronic thrombus formation, recanalization and the recanalization, this goes on till a portal cavernoma. Cavernoma is like a, a bunch of collaterals around the uh, portal hepatis that uh, that is uh, essentially collateral formation due to this on and off formation and recanalization of these portal vein thrombosis. And uh, that is how an EHPO differs from NCPF. So these are the two entities that comes under the common clinical syndrome for this non serotic portal hypertension. Okay. So, uh, so sir, next to cirrhosis, uh, NCPH is the most common cause of portal hypertension. Uh, next to cirrhosis. The two disease entities, this NCPH, namely NCPF, that is known cirrhotic portal fibrosis, and extrahepatic portal vein obstruction are distinct diseases presenting the features of portal hypertension, that is variceal bleed, glenomegaly, and near abnormal liver function. Likely pathogenesis is early age portal inflammation or infection in a prothrombotic individual. And both these conditions, uh, there is diagnosis needs exclusion of cirrhosis in uh, NCPF and presence of portal cavernoma in extrahepatic portal vein obstruction. And effective management of portal hypertension and its complications result in excellent five to 10 year survival. Okay. Uh, so uh, with this case, uh, definitely what we would like to uh, give an idea is basically uh, when you see a patient who has features of portal hypertension, and as in our case, he doesn't fit into a garden variant of cirrhosis. He uh, didn't have all these decompositing events that we normally would come across in patients over the past 15 years. But uh, over the, like, if you look at the last part of the history, patient is having ascites, on and off ascites, and uh, he's been now having a pleural effusion. So if you look at the history of a patient who has this NCPF, normally about 70% of these patients would well told with, we have a good life expectancy and they would be uh, having a five year survival rate of like almost about 90% provided their variceal bleed is tackled properly. But a very small uh, percentage of patients, like maybe 30% of patients, may develop as the disease progresses. It's been, it's been having 20 years of the disease. So may develop this uh, signs of liver cell failure very rarely. And even the liver parenchyma may undergo atrophy. And there may be conditions like the patient may even require a liver transplant because of this liver cell failure. But that too, only in less than 30% of the patients. So what we feel is this patient who had NCPF in the beginning, maybe he is going into uh, features of early liver cell, not a complete liver cell failure. He is having a, a change in the serum parenchyma as so it's evident on the fibro scan. And even the ascites. Normally, if you look at the clinical scenario of non serotic portal fibrosis, Transient ascites. As we uh, look, uh, in the history, we had seen that in 2018, when he had various bleed, he had ascites. But that just transiently came and went. That has been explained in the literature due to that transient liver cell dysfunction. But that picks up because the underlying liver is normal. But as time goes on, this uh, disease progresses into a condition where even the liver cell atrophy occurs. And maybe this ascites might not go even if you tackle the bleed. So further uh, working up, on, like uh, you should always monitor these patients, uh, like you should call them back to see if it's decompositing even like all these ascites and this pleural effusion, uh, is, is it going off after this acute insult? So if he persistently has all these features, maybe that's the time when we have to think this uh, uh, treating this variceal bleed might not be sufficient for him. You might have to work him up very rarely. Uh, like in my practice, I haven't seen maybe a one or two patients who had required transplant, but very rarely such patients may require transplant because of liver cell failure. And uh, definitely, this uh, like with this presentation, I just wanted to bring to you uh, this idea about this uh, clinical entity called non serotic portal hypertension because uh, like this is where the proverb all that glucose is not gold stands true because we might think it's just a garden made of cirrhosis 
but definitely if you look into the further management uh, further investigation and we can see in this patient he didn't have any pieces of cirrhosis so in this patient i would say a definitive diagnosis would be clinched by a liver biopsy and a portal vein doppler would uh, throw should throw some light on how the uh, portal system may have portospheric access is and but a liver biopsy in this setting with an inr 3.2 would be difficult so uh, we'll have to wait and watch till maybe we can get a correct window where we can do a liver biopsy because to diagnose ncpf the definitive uh, diagnostic criteria is to do a liver biopsy and see that there is no cirrhosis with other features like uh, portal vein sclerosis and uh, perisinusoidal fibrosis and all that so uh, I hope you all have gotten like an, at least an, like an idea about what this non-serotic portal hypertension is and what we should do for such patients when we come across such patients in a day-to-day -day practice. Thank you. I guess now uh, we can take uh, questions from the audience. Yeah. So if anybody has questions, uh, you can unmute and ask, or you can just uh, type in the chat box. Okay, uh, management of this patient. So, uh, as I was saying, uh, this patient uh, definitely doesn't uh, stick or claim, uh, definitely doesn't fall into the, uh, what do you say, doesn't fall into the, the garden variant of NCPA because he shows signs of some liver cell dysfunction over the past two, three years. And he's also developed some renal impairment. So this patient, definitely, you will have to work him up for the cause for this renal impairment. Uh, like, uh, definitely, he's having diabetes, so we should make sure that this doesn't have any underlying uh, nephropathy due to diabetes. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we should closely follow up this patient and uh, see how he uh, goes on in his future, like whether his ascites is most transient, now, uh, if his ascites uh, persists, if his ascites persists, that would be a bit worrying because that indicates uh, there is some liver cell dysfunction in this patient. And such patients, as I mentioned earlier, might require further management as we treat cirrhotic patients. And then regarding the variceal management, such patients should be kept under close surveillance. Uh, in the form of uh, routine endoscopic evaluation every six months. And the medically, you can give these beta blockers is for pranolol. And uh, during the very bleed attack, the vasoactive agents like vasopressin has been, uh, like all these uh, octotide and telepressin can be tried. And these non selective beta blockers like this propranolol and uh, carbidrol, all these drugs can be tried. And very rarely, if such patients do not respond to these regular treatment with endoscopic variceal banding, uh, we'll have to go in for advanced treatment therapies like a TIPS. TIPS is called as the as known as the trans jugular intrahepatic portosomic shunt, where we create a shunt between the portal vein and the inferior vena cava or the systemic circulation whereby we can reduce the portal pressures and further reduce the complications of portal hypertension. So uh, definitely these patients should be always kept under close surveillance. You should always keep an eye on their uh, liver functions. Uh, and definitely if the patient goes into any form of like persistent liver cell failure, patient developed encephalopathy, patient has persistent ascites, such patients might require very few patients might require transplant. 
Okay, I saw a question regarding uh, procoagulation workup. So is this procoagulation workup definitely, uh, it's been shown in literature that the patients who have this entity called NCPF, uh, this uh, not sodium portal hypertension, some of them have a thrombo, like prothrombotic states, but that is more commonly seen in the entity known as HPBO. And so such patients, uh, uh, like HPBO is an, uh, like as she was mentioning, as Sutra was mentioning, it is an entity where there is an obstruction or a portent thrombus that leads on to this portal hypertension. And so uh, such patients definitely need to be worked up for a prothrombotic event. You can do all your protein C, protein C deficiency and uh, your uh, fat laden and uh, so hyperomosis anemia, all these workups should be done. And uh, basically, the clinical presentation of EHPVO is different from NCPF. EHPVO, uh, the, uh, the, the most common presentation would be a uh, child, because normally they have variceal bleed in the first decade of life. So they present with variceal bleed during the first decade of life, and uh, they have features of growth retardation since the, uh, the first two decades of life is where the maximum growth occurs, obviously. And so in such patients, there is definitely a role of doing this prothrombotic workup and look for any prothrombotic, prothrombotic states and treat accordingly. And if you look at literature, there is no consensus that say that you should give up anticoagulation for such patients, unless the patient has a thrombus, an evident thrombus in his portal vein as an EHP view. In NCPF, a consensus does not say uh, the patient should be on anticoagulation. Any other questions from the audience? Hello? But I think uh, there are no more questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, first of all, like I should have uh, introduced and thank you before starting. So, definitely uh, thank you the, to the coordinators of this program and uh, thank you for this opportunity. And I hope like uh, this, the, we normally don't see such a case, it's very rare. If you look at the literature, in the late 80s, this entity called non serotic portal hypertension, uh, we, we, would, we could see a lot of patients, about 30% was the incidence of this disease entity back in the 80s. And the pathophysiology was attributed to like uh, an increased arsenic in the water supply and a recurrent uh, diarrheal infections that because uh, diarrheal infections were in the childhood. And especially in the EHPBO setting, this uh, the un uh, the unclean or unethical um, like there were situations where we used to uh, this uh, the stump of the umbilical cord was even cow dung like such practices were there in the rural India during this uh, uh, late 1980s you now so such practices definitely cause ascending infection and it's been studied in uh, it's been seen in the literature that. Recurrent infections or portal pyemia causing infection going uh, like acidic infection in the portal vein causes this disease to progress. So ever since that, all those uh, unhygienic conditions have been uh, eradicated, and even this 
uh, newer, like better health uh, scenarios have been brought up into our country. The incidence of this disease has actually drastically come down. Now, we like the incidence would be, I would say, less than 10% compared to the 25%, which was 30 years back. So that's why we don't see such cases in our part of the world. But Northern India, uh, definitely in that Gangetic belt, where the arsenic, the arsenic level in the water was very high, uh, it was found that definitely uh, that had to that had a close link of, in, the, in the pathophysiology of this disease. So that's why we don't see such diseases in our normal clinical practice, but. Definitely, I mean, the reason why we presented this case was not all portal hypertension is due to the cirrhosis. Due to cirrhosis, we should think about the other cause. Also. That's that's all. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, like you said, sir, uh, right from our MBBS days, we are taught of portal hypertension, cirrhosis, portal hypertension, cirrhosis, and we yeah. usually discusses those cases only. So this yeah, was yeah. definitely, sir, uh, you definitely threw light into that topic. Uh, it was a less explored topic and definitely we'll at least think of it when we see such patients. So uh, thank you so much, sir, for taking time up to the BBC schedule. And we hope we'll definitely see you again in all our future academic sessions as well. Uh, thank yeah. you, sir. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, our presenter, Dr. Suchitra. Uh, it was uh, an interesting case and the patient definitely had a very long history. So you took so, so much effort in even uh, bringing out the minutest details. So congratulations and thank you for presenting it so well. Uh, I also thank uh, all the participants who have attended this session. I uh, hope to see you all in the next session. Uh, thank you and good night all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Thank you, Dr. Joe.